Okay, we, we can go through it, but the problem may be the molecule box is not active there. So if there is a problem like that, then I need to go with you and see what is happening. So I did, it's kind of interesting, scientists, so that you are doing right. And so <laughs> I'll show you what I'm <laughs> I'll show you what I'm trying. Maybe first you can see whether you're doing the same thing. If it is, then the problem might come around. Hello. It's not picking up. Hello. <coughs> Okay, and that's now, thank you. <laughs> How's it? Well, <laughs> okay. Um, before I come and demonstrate that answer this question, let me tell you a little bit about the Nixon exam. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you want to know about that. <laughs> How did you find the exam? What was the feeling? Learning was tricky. I I think I told you about that. So. <laughs> right. I posted the solution and we saw that four of you have looked at it already and others haven't looked at it. Uh, <laughs> um, do you want me to go through the exam in the class sometime or not? Would you rather? Hmm? Uh, I have it here, but I was not going to give it to you at the beginning of the class. So I'll give you the end of the class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. Small class, so kind of not right. So I um, yeah. Well, let me suggest this. I'll distribute it at the end of this class. Take a look at it and take a look at the solution on the right. And if you want me to go through it, since things are not clear, I can do it on Friday. Um, the average, let's get some statistics, you know, I guess when you get your exam back, you know, when you watch, in relation to others. Uh, I don't have absolute marks. Uh, the last uh, relative, uh, because the difficulty of the exam can be different. So, don't pay attention to the absolute mark. What is important is in the relative position in respect to others. And the average was 69. And uh, I did give thought marks. Maybe I will explain the purposes that I use for marking so that when you look at your exam, you can understand the rationale behind it. Uh, the range was quite large. That concerns me a bit. The minimum was 38. That concerns me. The maximum doesn't concern me. It's not really good. <laughs> uh, there was one person. Uh, and I think uh, only one person got the second problem. But that disappointed me, I should say. The second problem, uh, which was just a numerical one, uh, the salt water concentration changes from half to percent I've given you the expression, and you say, I figured out it's just a substitution there that gives you 10 points. And it's basically substituting things and getting back how and then getting back the total sum back. So that, that part it was to uh, get 10 points. But it's figuring out the left hand side what is the amplitude and what is the change. That's the first step. 
And uh, the graph and the solution that we have seen in the class is one where there is a step change up. So uh, it goes up from a lower value to a higher value on an exponential growth. But in this particular problem, it's a step change of down. So from 5% to 0.5%. Uh, no, from 5% to 0% actually because it's pure water. But you want to know uh, what flow rate will cause the concentration uh, at that uh, 5%. So most of you figured out that it was substitution into that equation, but figuring out that the step change down and that you're going basically to it, the only one person figured that out, from uh, 5 to 0.5, 10 percent of the words in the value. That means a 90 percent change. And if you didn't figure that out, you just substitute a 5 and 0.5 for y and a, then you don't get the right answer. Uh, I was kind of disappointed about that, but the, I was very happy with the third problem. Many of you did almost all the parts except for the last one. The last one was meant to be to see who can take that extra step and synthesize what we have seen together and put them all together. Now, if I had given a series of sample functions, which is the product, but here there are two inputs, so there is a little bit of a trick involved, but the number of you were able to kind of jump through that because there are two graphs. The first problem was just a lot of checking a lot of simple concepts here and there. All of these different things like concept uh, different uh, compliance functions and things like that. So that's all also fine. Okay. An average is not the first time that's going to be a good average. But if you're way below the average and if you feel that you need additional help, give you additional work or uh, go over material that is not clear to you. Uh, you're not seeing anything. Are you graduating? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So I don't want this course to hold you up. From that. <laughs> <laughs> so if uh, you need additional help, please take some of Okay. <coughs> the marking for all the questions are actually broken down in the question paper, so you'll be able to. With that. And so the only major pattern, repetitive pattern that we saw is in the second part. So there I divided the mark into 10 and 10. So the right hand side is the first part. You got the right correct value for the left hand side. So the right hand side. Now, in the last uh, lecture, we looked at this case, we were reviewing for the exam, uh, building the transfer function process. And I, I'm again going to depart from the prepared lecture today to work with you on the same problem with this idea of linearization. I think what might help uh, at least some people who are having difficulty uh, is to have more examples. So I will try to do a few more examples in the class. So we're going to look at, uh, we started seeing what linearization is about. So we just took a nonlinear curve, uh, a cubic equation. And we found the free root and said around the root I want to approximate that function by a linear function. So linear function meaning straight line geometrically, graphically, but with differential equations, it's a linear equation. From a nonlinear equation to a linear equation. And that's the linearization process. So we're going to I'm going to lay out the general recipe for doing this. And you can actually use the symbolic toolbox to go through this uh, recipe. And then we will develop the same example that we had discussed in the last lecture and go through the linearization process and uh, implementation in uh, in MATLAB. Okay. So the general procedure for linearization is the following. You are given a nonlinear equation. Okay. The nonlinear equation is represented in this form, dy dt equals some function of y u. This is a dynamical system. T is a time independent variable, y is a dependent variable. And u here is the input. Okay. Now y could be called, sometimes it's called a state variable, sometimes it is directly related to the output variable. So we are trying to develop a relationship between the input u and the output y, or in some cases, uh, output could be represented by a different symbol. Okay. So this is the starting point. You arrive at this model by writing down conservation law whether it is fluid mechanics, heat transfer, mass transfer, reaction engineering, you write down the basic model and you end up with an equation like this. 
f is a nonlinear function of y in general. Okay? And what you want to do is for control purposes, you want to find out what is the steady state operation by solving the steady state equation. And then linearize that nonlinear equation around that steady state, introducing deviation variable around that steady state. And there are really no new concepts, except you need to recall what the Taylor theory is. Okay. So the first step would be to write down the steady state model for that, which simply means on the left hand side dy dt equal to zero, is what we have. On the right hand side, I'm putting the subscript s, y s u s, to indicate that it is the steady state value that satisfies this particular equation. Now this is a nonlinear equation, so you need to solve this nonlinear equation to find the value of y s for a given input u s. So u s is the input, y s is the output. In such a way that equation is satisfied. When I plug in those values into that function f, that equation must be satisfied. Those are going to be numbers. U s and y s are going to be numbers. These are steady state inputs, steady state output values for that model. Okay. Now the linear equation simply says I'm going to take the nonlinear expression and do a Taylor series expansion around that steady state. U S Y S. Okay. And that's why I have the very first term is that function evaluated at U S Y S. This is a multivariate Taylor series. So uh, F of U S Y S plus D S D Y, the derivative of the function, evaluated at at that value U S Y S. So it's going to be a number, it's going to be the slope information. Geometrically this is the equation for a tangent, the slope. Multiplied by y minus y s. That is the difference away from y s. So what we are doing is if y s is a certain value and starting to measure things from y s. Y minus y s is the departure. This is the deviation variable. Deviation variable naturally occurs in the territory. Last, next I'm asking the question how does the function f change if I make changes to u, the input. I'm doing the input linearization also the output linearization and the input linearization times u minus u s. Once again, that is the deviation variable plus the higher order term, the quadratic term, the cubic term, etc. in the Taylor series. Now, any questions on this? You all understand the Taylor series expansion? You're comfortable with dealing with this, right? Okay. So now what I'm going to do is go back to the original equation and replace the right hand side f in terms of its Taylor series expansion, this whole term on the right hand side. On the left hand side, I'm writing this as y minus y s, which I have always done simply because y s is a constant number. If I'm taking the derivative, I don't change anything. But that allows me to introduce the deviation variable naturally on the left hand side of the equation. Okay? Any questions? So, on the left hand side, I have d dt of y minus y s, which is Basically, the original term, I have introduced my f in terms of the constant. On the right hand side, I have replaced it by the Taylor series f at y s u s plus d f dy times y minus y s plus d f du times u minus u s. Now, now I'm defining my capital Y as my deviation variable y minus y s and capital U as u minus u s. So the first term simply becomes capital uh, D capital Y DT in terms of the deviation variable. Now what do they do with this term and can you explain to me why I don't have it? That is steady state, that is zero. I have found my Y as U as in such a way I have it as a Y as U as U is zero. That is zero. So that term will drop out as zero, and so I don't have it. And then I have the derivative, partial derivative of y f with respect to y, multiplied by this deviation variable capital Y and dfdu, which is a number. After evaluating the derivative, you plug in y s u s the number. Okay? So both these are just constants. These are Both of them are constant. Multiplied by y and then second term multiplied by u. That is my linearized equation. So the linearization step involves basically two steps. First, get the steady state solution, 
then do a Taylor series expansion, introduce the deviation variable, evaluate the coefficients of the derivatives at the steady state, and you have your linearized state. Now, this is the linear first order equation. So, the first order transfer function will come out of this. Once you go into the Laplace domain, and you'll be able to get from this one by taking Laplace transform, you should get uh, y of s divided by u of s is equal to 1 divided by, uh, if there is a tau there, and if there is no tau, there will be tau s plus tau. If tau is 1, then it's going to be simply s plus 1. In this particular case, the time constant is just the one tau s. Okay. So, this is the uh, essence of linearization process, and now we can use this model to analyze the response of the system. Here I just added this note saying let's do an example together. Maybe we can take a piece of paper and start working on this model. Um, the model is the same one that we saw in the last lecture, the review lecture. So I'm going to give you the model equation as tau dc dt. Um, equals e i minus c minus beta c squared. Okay. Now this is a third tank reactor. C of c is the concentration of the uh, reactant, and c i is the inlet concentration, and tau is F over uh, V over F. V is the volume of the tank, F is the flow rate, okay. and beta is the rate constant. Some, some constant. So in this particular problem, just to fix ideas, let's take tau is equal to 2, beta equal to 2, and initially, the CI, the inlet concentration, is 0.5. These are the numbers that we are going to deal with. So, that is where. <laughs> That's it. So, V will give you that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. So, what is the difference that you notice between this problem and the problem that we did uh, last Friday? Second order reaction, okay, and that makes it a nonlinear problem. Okay, so the function that I have here, tau dc dt, equals this nonlinear function with c i and c as the input and output. Beta is a number, okay, and that function is given by c i minus c minus beta c squared. Now, you already know how to get a solution to this problem using ODE 405. You can write a function, you can integrate it, and including the full nonlinear effect, you can predict what the dynamics is going to be. But we want to be able to use this model for control purposes, designing a controller. Now, designing control with nonlinear systems is a very difficult topic. We will not be able to get into that in this course. Okay? So, this is why we do the linearization. And the linearization is good because most of the reactors operate under steady state conditions. So this was also part of uh, one of your questions in the exam, you can find the steady state value. So the first thing that we need to do is find the steady state. So I'm going to repeat the same step that I outlined earlier, okay? How to get the steady state, how to do the linearization, how to get the transfer function, and then uh, play with it in math lab and figure it out. So the steady state will be zero is equal to C i f minus C f minus beta times C f squared. How do I solve this? I have to have a quadratic complex. In MATLAB, there are a number of tools uh, that are available to solve this. I will show you later on. But let's just take the quadratic equation for now and write this as I'm going to flip the sign. Beta C S square plus C S minus C I S equals to zero. So C S 
the steady state output concentration is equal to minus. We want to do this from kind of our own. Let's see. Plus minus square root of one plus four divided divided by three square. Does that make sense? Do I have an error there? Yeah. Deliberately introduced an error I want to do the you put it up there. You've forgotten you put that in Looks fine. How about this? be there, right? And that's a very important uh, observation because what this tells you is that the output steady state concentration depends on the input steady state concentration. So if you maintain the inlet concentration constant, you might have the hope of reaching the steady state and if that, said, that steady state is given by that. So this output steady state is determined by also the parameter value beta. But more importantly, it is determined by the inlet operating condition, the inlet concentration. So if you change that, the outlet concentration will change. Now you can substitute the numbers because I have given you CISS 0.5, um, the inlet concentration, I guess it's just the inlet steady concentration of 0.5, where I have given, so you're going to get two rules, okay, two solutions to this particular problem. And that is a common feature of nonlinear problems. The next step, any questions on that? The next step, again, I want you to do the Taylor series expansion for this particular problem. That is the key. Okay, so I'll give you a minute, write it out, and then I'll write it out, and then we'll see what I'm going to do. So it's basically the partial derivative of that function with respect to C at the steady state multiplied by the C minus Cs plus the partial derivative of that function with respect to Ci at steady state multiplied by Ci minus C minus S. Okay, but we have already, so this is zero because we have found out the steady state solution. And so equal to partial derivative of f with respect to c, what would that be? What is the function? Minus 1, minus 2 beta, minus 1, minus 2 beta. beta c. Okay, c square, derivative of c square is 2c. Okay. But that is evaluated at the steady state value. So that derivative must be a number. Okay. So this is the derivative. You take the derivative and then substitute uh, c, uh, cf, steady state value, multiplied by c minus cf plus df dci. What would that be? Here, ci is derivative of that function of respect to ci would be this one. Okay. So it's going to be 1 multiplied by ci minus c. Now introduce a deviation variable. Let c prime be equal to c minus c f. And ci prime be equal to c prime minus c i f. The deviation variable.
So your function f of ci c becomes minus 1 minus 2 beta cs multiplied by 2 prime plus c i prime. That's a Taylor series expansion. Keep the linear term. Evaluate the coefficients at the steady state. It is this term. The second term happens to be 1. So it doesn't uh, depend on the steady state value. And then the last step is uh, original equation tau. So write this as tau gdt of c prime equals uh, minus 1 minus 2 beta cs of c prime plus c prime. That is your linearized model in the dynamical domain, in the time domain. You should be able to do, do this no matter how complicated the function on the right hand side is. Now, if you have a very complicated function on the right hand side, you can use the diff function in symbolic program. If you take the derivative and it will do the substitution with the steady state value and give you the final number. Okay, we will learn how to do that later on. I want you to get the concept correct right now. Okay. Now, what do you do next? What we want is a relationship between CI and C, so the input perturbation in the input concentration to the output concentration. So take the Laplace uh, transform. And go into the Laplace domain, so you're going to get tau s c prime s uh, plus, you can bring this to the left hand side, 1 plus c beta s c prime s is equal to c i prime s. Okay, just taking the Laplace transform. I moved the C term to the left hand side in the same step. And that gives you um, tau s plus 1 plus C beta s prime by C prime s equals C i prime s. So C prime s divided by C i plus tau s equals 1 divided by Sometimes you would see this written as normalized coefficient being the second term, so you will see this written as 1 divided by 1 plus 2 beta divided by tau divided by 1 plus 2 beta s plus 1. All you are doing is dividing every term by 1 plus 2 beta to make the second term as 1. And that's the standard form. The reason for that is most of the Laplace transform tables you will see it written as A divided by tau s plus 1. So when you do the inverse transform, you get e to the power um, minus 2 tau. Question, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you very much. I should have. So here I missed it. I had it there, but here in these two places I missed it. Very important because that's what gives you the steady state information. Sorry, can you read from the back? Thanks. So, 1 plus 2 beta times CS. CS is the steady state value. And that whole thing is a number. Any questions? Okay, now let's see. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, you, you can. There are situations where you can. In this particular case, I guess you probably won't. Yeah. One positive and negative. Right? But there are a lot of examples in the literature where the nonlinearity of the kinetics gives rise to what they call multiple operating steady states. So it's actually physically possible to operate a reactor in two different steady states. Most common example uh, would be, I don't know, have you used the Bunsen burner in a chemistry lab? 
and uh, the two typical states would be the lit up state and the extreme state. So controlling the flow rate of the gas to the kernel, you can have two states. Okay. Um, so there, there are many, many examples in the literature uh, of uh, multiplicity and steady state. Then you need to worry about which particular steady state is stable. In order to do that, we need to look at the eigenvalues of the particular steady state. And you will see the exact idea. But it is possible. It is possible that you have both uh, uh, as a realistic solution. So what I'm going to do now is show you some of the MATLAB tools available for first getting the steady state solution because there are two steps to it. You need to solve uh, somehow analytically or numerically. In this case, we were able to do it because of the quadratic equation. But what happens if it is a term that involves sine and cosine and e to the power and you want to find the steady state solution? One of the tools that are available, MATLAB, MathCAD, they all have a lot of nonlinear algebraic equations solved. So we will use that to get the steady state solution. Then you know the steady state numbers, you go through the linearization and you get the linear transfer function. So in the linear transfer function, you will have constants. Those constants depend on the steady state. See, like this constant, this is an effective time constant. Tau divided by 1 plus 2 beta Cs is the effective time constant for this, for this process. And that depends on the steady state value Cs. So you have to evaluate that number. And then you will be able to look at step response and input response. Okay. So the first, the first function that I guess we have already seen is uh, the so-called uh, solve function. I'm going to type this for you. And And what, what have I done there? I don't know. Can you see that? Is this font small? Can you see it now? Okay. So what have I done there? I have called the function built in MATLAB function called solve, and I'm passing to it the steady state expression. Okay. Steady state expression where I have substituted the numbers for beta and for the inlet concentration CIS, which is 0.5. So it analyzes that and knows CS is the only symbol there. So it solves for CS, it gives me the two solutions. One is negative concentration, the other one is a positive concentration. It's a possible one that I'm going to deal with. Uh, the other way to solve this would be what? Do you remember? So let me define these constants quickly. Yeah? Beta is 2. Pi is 2. Pi is 0.5. So I'm going to use the same solve. So this is the same idea between transfer function in two different modes. Depending on what the input is, the TF function behaves differently. So in the same way, solve when I pass it as uh, beta minus one ci. What am I doing here? Root is a function that we have seen before. Root takes the coefficient of a polynomial. So in this case, the polynomial is uh, the quadratic. So it's beta c squared plus cs, which is uh, plus cs. the same two rules, but now it is numerically returned. So there is a difference between the numbers that is returned previously, which was up to 
as long as I did it, right? And that is, it does it symbolically and then converts it into numerical string for the finite precision. Symbolic toolbox can give you as many precisions as you want. You can set the precision. Whereas numerically, it is always defaulted to about 14 to 15 digits. Now, it prints only four digits. So if you go to format long and then call the root, it will give you 14 significant digits. That is the numerical result. Same result. Okay. So the root function takes the coefficient of the polynomial and solves it, whereas the solve function takes an expression, whatever the expression is. So solve function is much more powerful. We have a chance of getting solutions to more complicated number of issues. Whereas root will deal only with polynomial expression. There is another function called F0, okay, which also solves nonlinear algebraic equations um, of any complicated form. Okay. And in order to do that, you will use it the same way that you use the ODE four fact. You need to write a function. Okay. So let me see whether I can this function written already. Here I have written a function called CFTRSS, the steady state model, which takes a guessed value for the composition as an input and returns the function value. The function value is simply CI minus C minus beta times C squared divided by tau. Okay. Define all these. So this simply calculates, if you give me a guess value for C, it will calculate what is the function value and return that. So if I just call it as CSTRSS, 0 0.3090, what do, what do you think I will get? You should get 0.5. Any other guess? Why do you say 0.5? Right, but I have fixed CI to be 0.5 here. Okay. So what should this function, what it is doing is calculating the entire function. So what should that function be if I put the outlet concentration? You know, this, these, these are the things that tell me that you are grasping what I'm talking about. Right. You should get zero. Right. So. It will give me a number that's close enough to zero because I put only seven significant digits. It's zero to second But the real power of this, uh, if I put any other value, like 0.5, it is going to give me a non-zero value. So for c is 0.5, the function value is minus 0.5. Now f zero, I use it as c s c r s s comma zero point five, for example. So what this function, this is a useful and a very powerful function. What this function F0 does is take any nonlinear function that you give, a single equation, and you write the function for that. Just like in ODE45, you wrote the function. ODE45 gives you the complete time trajectory by integrating that differential equation. This solves the algebraic equation and tells you for what value of that unknown, whatever the unknown is in that function, that function will be zero. So it drives the function to zero by continuously searching for the values of c. So you tell it, initially start your search from starting with 0.5. So it sends in 0.5, it gets back minus 0.25 from the function. So it gets like the answer. So it sends in another value, another value, until it drives that function to zero. So that is the solution. You started with 0.5 as the initial guess, and it gives you the solution as 0.30. One, the CST, what does the function do? Or what is the value in here? So, th th this is a function which takes in any guess that you make for C and calculates, like, it for example, it will come here and calculate what are the function values. I'm not sure I'm understanding your question, but let me. That's okay. What does the function represent? Here it is. The steady state part of the equation. The steady state part of the equation. Because what I want is I want to find out that value of concentration Cs 
that satisfies this equation. Okay, I want to solve for the steady state solution from this equation. So in this equation, I know where I will run the endonuclear transition. But I need to find out what value of T is in this equation. Now, we did that here, I think we found the totality of this, the same that it is zero, or going to this quadratic then at zero will help you to find the solution. And all, all you need to do is define that function in a file. This is what we have done here. Define that function. So that function takes some input argument concentration, the unknown, in that f of x equals to zero. X is the unknown. It says what value of x will make that function equal to zero. So this function is simply calculating the value. Let me give you another way of uh, answering the same question. Suppose I take um, I think <coughs> t equals 0 0.1 to 1. Just creating a vector, t going from 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, etc. Then I create a function f equals c s t r f f t. What is this going to do? It might give me an error message. <laughs> It came in with all the values of C. Now, let me ask you, just a MATLAB issue. What will be the size of the vector C here? It should have all the values of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, all the way to 1. About 11 numbers will be there. Okay. Then it takes each one of those and tries to calculate this function F for each one of those function values, the C values. And then it will return all those function values. Then I can plot F versus C and ask the question, where does the function cause the x axis? That is my solution. Okay. That's what this function is trying to do. This function is trying to give me a mechanism whereby I can plot this function and ask the question, where is the function cause the x axis? Am I looking clear? Okay. So let me. There's an error there, and the error is because this operation cannot be done. Yeah, I'm not sure that you need the dot star. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. We don't, we don't really need this. Yeah. The dot is saying that when you have a vector of numbers and you want to apply an operation, you have to apply to each element of that. Otherwise, a star b is a matrix multiplication. So if you start a dot star b that A and B should have the same size matrix and just take the first element of A and multiply the first element of B, second element of A, second element of B. Whereas the matrix multiplication is the first row, the first column and add it up. So there's a slight dif difference in the definition of the dot star operation. Okay, that's it. Now I got a function. So now I can plot C to my F. And you can see that it goes to zero somewhere around point three here. That's what F0 wants to find. So F0 makes a continuous call to this function CSTRFS, changing the input value, seeing when the function changes sign, and narrowing it down. In your numerical methods course, you would have seen what kind of algorithm F0 would use. Are you running numerical course? Okay, so, uh, but for our purposes, that's not important. So F0 basically is a function that gives you ability to solve a nonlinear algebraic equation. There's another function called f solve, which does a system of nonlinear algebraic equations. These tools you, you do need solve, f solve, f0, group. All of them have very similar functions depending on the nature of the uh, nonlinear algebraic equation. Okay. Now I have these numbers. Okay. 
So I'm going to The value. So this is a steady state solution that I'm saving as a variable. Okay. Now I'm going to define my transfer function. Okay. One, comma, tau, one plus t tau theta plus t tau. So what am I doing here? You have to recall. What is the form of the transfer function? I'm doing it in this form. The numerator has a constant, so the numerator coefficient should be one. And the denominator, I have two coefficients. It's a linear term, so tau is one. The other one is one plus two data t f. Okay, so both the numbers I should enter uh, in the transfer function. So that's basically what you see. One here, and then tau. There's a space there. That space tells is the second number. That is uh, one plus two times beta times the x. Now you need to help me. Where did I make a mistake? Thank you. That is my transfer function. For the space nonlinear CSTR. But around the steady state of point three zero three zero nine zero. Okay. Now I can say set so I can now I have built the tool, I can ask questions like what is the step response? For this particular case. Okay. So if I make a step change, unit step change, then this is how the exit concentration will change. So it doesn't start immediately, but it has a characteristic corresponding. And a characteristic amplitude. The final steady state that it reaches is somewhere around 0 0.444. How do I get that? If you look at this graph carefully, what, what is the interpretation for the y axis? This is a step response for that transfer function that I had where I made a unit step change in the inlet concentration. So you have to understand what this is. We had the column on the reactor operating in this steady state with the inlet concentration being 0.5, right? And uh, we obtained the steady state model. Now I'm saying from that I'm making a unit step response. So the outlet concentration at that time was 0 0.3090. This is going to be the outlet concentration. So if I ask you the question, what would be the final concentration? What would your answer be? Right. How did you get that? Because this is a deviation from the steady state. The steady state, if you want to put an axis on the original variable, this would be starting at point three zero. Because of the deviation variable, the time is zero. So in terms of the deviation variable, the steady state is somewhere around 0.5. So the actual concentration would be somewhat yeah. higher. Now the next question, because you you said somewhere around 0.75, do you have a reason for saying somewhere around 0.75, or is it just you can yeah. add it to that number? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's that's what we meant, right? That's what it's asked. But there is a more subtle point. Is that the final concentration that you will get if I make a unit step response to the full nonlinear model? No. We are linearizing it. That's an important point that you need to understand. Okay? So this gives you a way of predicting what the final steady state will be. But remember, as you are going farther away from the steady state, this linear dynamic model will become less and less useful. So the final concentration that you predict from this is not really going to be that good. It's one of the problems plaguing any chemical plant when you are making a step change. Yeah. The more inaccurate it is. 
and the next assignment I'm going to design a problem that will illustrate the magnitude of this problem. The larger the deviation from the steady state, the less accurate this model is. So this model is good for disturbance rejection, meaning if there are disturbances coming from the problem and you want to reject it and get it back to the original steady state, control that you design based on this will be perfect. But if you are making the so-called regulatory problem where you are making the step change, your step change must be small enough compared to the steady state. So far away, then the model itself needs to be retuned. What does retuning mean? From the new steady state, get the new solution and evaluate your problem. Once again, I'm laying out the broad parameters and we will work through these in detail. Okay, so you can take your exam. So tomorrow morning we won't have any session in MATLAB. Uh, we'll see how the next lecture will be